Good morning, church. I don't know um, when the last time was that you read the book of Judges, but I was thinking this week as I was contemplating this concept of uh, spiritual warfare, uh, this interesting story we read about in Judges 7 when Gideon is going up um, against the forces of Midian. And the Midianites are a pretty formidable army. Gideon doesn't have such a bad army himself. He goes up with 32,000 men. And that's a pretty good number. Um, They might call it a mega church. And along the way, God decides that this is far too many men for Gideon to have, even though he is going against the Midianites. The reason was because God must have the glory. 32,000 men might be tempted to say, hey, the victory is ours. Look at what a great army we have. And so God instructs Gideon, and Gideon says, if anybody is afraid, go ahead and go home right now. 22,000 men leave, 10,000 left. Not good enough. God will have the glory. Here's another test. They go down by the river. The number of men who drink on their knees with their face down, just drinking straight from the river, is 9,700. 300 of them kneel down, bring the water up in their hands, and drink it while their eyes are looking around, making sure that they're alert and ready for any kind of a sneak attack. These are the 300 men that God instructs Gideon to use to go into battle to fight for the Lord's glory. And it's with these 300 men who were ready warriors that God exalts himself. And scripture tells us that our life is a battle. The Christian life is warfare. That's what it is. Warfare imagery fills the pages of scripture from one end to the other. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, then you know how much of a war it is. The spiritual realm all around you is an unseen war raging between the angels of God's kingdom and the demons of darkness. And you are part of that spiritual battle, though perhaps not in exactly the same way as the angels. But it's a tough battle nonetheless. And I wonder if you ever feel weary. If you ever feel like this battle sometimes is overwhelming and is something that you can't really do. And if that's you, and I suspect that perhaps it is, and I know this might sound odd, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Because it means you know something about yourself. It means you know the situation you're in, that you yourself are weak and cannot stand in the spiritual battle against sin and Satan. Perhaps you've noticed that whenever you try on your own, you fall. But you have a good God who loves you and wants you to come to him with all of your needs. And when he says all of your needs, he means all of them. And that includes the need for spiritual strength. This is the God that we're taught to exalt in the model prayer that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches us to come to God in adoration praising him for who he is and for what he's done, and praying that his name would be honored and his gospel would spread throughout the world. Those are the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And in the second half of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to bring to the Father all of our needs. And if you would open with me to Matthew 6 this morning, we're going to take a look at this together, particularly as it relates to the battle that we find ourselves in as those who are in Christ. So in Matthew 6, I'll read verses 9 through 13 once again, a prayer with which we're very familiar, the Lord's Prayer. Also, as we saw last week, it's the disciples' prayer. It's the one that Jesus gives us to be praying along the lines of. Not verbatim, as if we just say these words and then, you know, we're good to go. This, This is categories of prayer in our Christian life that the Father delights for us to pray. So beginning in verse 9, these are the words of Jesus. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. (coughs) And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You see, when we spend time in prayer to God, our priority is to exalt him. Our priority is to focus on his glory in both our lives and in the world that he's made. And that's what's behind the first three petitions. 
And then as we begin to bring him our needs, we enter into a set of three kinds of prayer needs that in which we actually see that as Christians, we pray to a triune God. And so if you think about it for just a moment and look at verses 11, 12, and 13, when we bring God our need for daily provision, for our daily bread, we come to a father who all throughout scripture reveals himself uh, as our creator and as our provider. He does what good fathers do. They provide for their families and our father provides for us. And when we bring God our need for daily forgiveness, we come through the son who gave his life in our place that we might have redemption. Because of Jesus and through him, redemption and forgiveness are possible. And then in the sixth petition in verse 13, which we're focusing on today, we bring the father our need for the Holy Spirit's protecting care. Because it is by the indwelling spirit who scripture calls the seal of our redemption that we are told we have sanctifying grace. It is because the Holy Spirit dwells within us that we can persevere. It is because the Holy Spirit is in us, ministering to us the power of Jesus, that we are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Our prayers as Christians are Trinitarian prayers. If I could sum up the sixth petition in verse 13 that we're looking at, Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is what he's teaching us. He's teaching us to seek the Father's protecting care daily as we flee from temptation and war against sin. That's what this is about. He's teaching us to daily be seeking the Father's protecting care as we flee from temptation and war against sin. This is the key. This is a key to the Christian life, which is why it's one of the central prayers that Jesus tells us to make part of our daily communion with God. So let's dive into it by looking at what it means to pray against temptation. When's the last time you were tempted to sin? It's been a while, right? A few minutes if you're super holy. <laughs> During this worship service, temptation to sin is a daily part of the battle of the Christian life. And every true believer has a major stake in withstanding temptation and resisting sin. And what Jesus puts front and center in our thinking about temptation is the fact that as we face it, we must not do it alone. We must not do it alone. We must be praying about our temptations because only God is able to make us stand. We need to pray for God's protecting grace to withstand temptation. But as soon as we begin to unpack the words, lead us not into temptation, we run into some trouble. In English, this doesn't seem as obvious to us, but in Greek, it's not immediately obvious at all what Jesus is talking about. You see, the word translated temptation here in verse 13 is the word perasmos, perasmos, and it has two meanings in the New Testament, two meanings depending on the context. The first possible meaning of perasmos is trial, which is the idea of testing. It's basically a trial is any difficulty in life that has the purpose of testing our faith to see how genuine it is and to strengthen it. Trials produce godliness, and James, in his epistle, uses the word perosmos in this sense. In verses 2 and 3 of, his, of chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so it's possible that Jesus is using the word perosmos with strengthening trials in mind when he gives us the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And if this is the case, he's teaching us to pray that we would not encounter trials. That's possible. But it's also possible that he has the second meaning of the word in mind, which is temptation. If a trial is a difficulty that tests and examines a person in order to strengthen that person, then temptation, though, on a different side, is not a test. It's a pressure that's intended to produce a fault, to, to entrap a person so that they would sin. So temptation aims to strengthen or I'm sorry, trial aims to strengthen, temptation aims to snare, okay? Temptation aims to snare and weaken us. And so what are we supposed to be praying here? What does Jesus mean when he uses this word? Are we praying to be kept from trials or are we praying to be kept from temptations? Well, as with most words in scripture, context usually determines the meaning. And so what is the context? Well, I think there's two things here that help us see that Jesus probably has in mind what our ESV translators settled on, which is temptation. 
The first clue we have is that the second half of Matthew 6, 13 says, but deliver us from evil. Or as it says in a footnote, um, or perhaps if you have a different translation, it might say, deliver us from the evil one. The key word is the word but here, okay? But deliver us from evil. This is a connecting word that takes the second half of the verse and brings it together with the first half of the verse. Now what Jesus is doing here is he's using a Hebrew literary tool called parallelism. And the way that this works is that the second line expands on the idea of the first line. Okay, the second half of the line expands on the idea of the first line. So, if the idea of the first line is, Father, lead us not into temptation. In other words, Father, keep us from temptation. Then the idea gets expanded in the second line as not only keep us from temptation, but please rescue us from the evil one who tempts us. Don't lead us into temptation. In fact, keep us from the one who does tempt us. So it's a prayer that the Father wouldn't allow us to be in situations where we'd be pressed to sin, especially by the tempter. And the second clue that Jesus has temptation in mind here is the fact that as we saw in James 1, what are we supposed to do with trials? Rejoice in them. Why? Well, they produce steadfastness. Question, is steadfastness in the Christian life a good thing? Yeah. Does God use trials in order to produce that in us? He does. So it doesn't really make much sense that Jesus would be teaching us to pray that God wouldn't do exactly what God says he's going to do, which is to strengthen us, oftentimes through trials. No, Jesus wants us to pray that God wouldn't lead us into temptation to sin. And as soon as we realize this, though, we run into another sticky wicket. What does it mean to pray, lead us not into temptation? In other words, what is God's relationship to our temptations? Because last time we checked, God's really not in the business of trying to ensnare us, is he? No, he's our father. Fathers don't try to get their children to fail. If they do, they need a good slap upside the head and, and become a better father. See, we know that God brings trials into our life to test and refine us and grow us in our love for him and our dependence on him. But would he ever lead us into temptation? And if he wouldn't, then why do we need to pray that he wouldn't? You see, as we get a little further on in the book of James, in verses 13 and 14 in that first chapter, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And so we need to fix this clearly in our minds. God cannot and will not tempt us to sin because he is the Holy One who loves us and cannot tempt us to sin. It's not in his nature. God never seeks to trap us. So temptation comes from other places. Temptation comes from other places, as we see here and as we'll see in a moment. But at the same time that we realize that God cannot tempt us to sin, we also realize that our Father is a sovereign Father. He is the Father who is ruling over all things. All things happen, as Scripture says, according to the counsel of his will. And that includes our temptations, and it includes even our own decisions to sin. So those desires of our heart that James is talking about and saying, these are the things that are enticing you and are alluring you to walk away from God, God knows. God is sovereign even over that. That doesn't catch him by surprise. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're asking that in his sovereignty, he wouldn't allow us to enter into situations where we'll be tempted to wander from him. We're saying, Father, protect us from what we know we're all, we're all too prone to. What we would naturally wander into ourselves, please, Father, keep us in your sovereignty from those situations. So we don't want to wander from you. So if temptation doesn't come from our good and loving father, where does it come from? In southwestern Montana, there's a little town called Three Forks that was built right at the headwaters of the Missouri River. The Missouri River's pretty big, but it doesn't just spring up out of a hole in the ground. <laughs> it's the result of three rivers coming together and making it what it is. And so Three Forks is built where the Jefferson, Gallatin, and Madison Rivers come together to form the Missouri. And this is like sin. See, God reveals in the Bible that there are three headwaters of temptation that come together to feed this great beast in our lives that we call sin. 
You're familiar with these three things, I'm sure. They're called the world, the flesh, and the devil. And by the world being a source of temptation, we're not talking about the physical world that God made as if somehow this world is bad. No, we know because God made it that it is good. In fact, he looked on it when he originally made it and he said, this is very good. And, and we know that the world is not sinful inherently because Jesus, God's son, entered into it and became part of it as the man Jesus Christ. And he sanctifies this world. In fact, we're promised that one day it will be restored to its perfect state because of what Christ did in defeating sin on the cross. Now, when we talk about the world, when scripture talks about the world as a source of temptation, he's, Jesus is talking about a world full of people and their cultures who are under the influence of sin and Satan, who are out to entrap God's people and conform God's holy saints into the image of the world. It's in this sense that Jesus says in Matthew 18, woe to the world for temptations to sin. When we're surrounded by a culture that hates God, we may be tempted to act like that culture in order to be cool. It's like the cool kids. That doesn't end in school. The enticements of the world are all around us. The world is a source of temptation and often tries to trip us up. The second headwater of temptation is what the New Testament calls the flesh. And by the flesh, we mean what sometimes gets translated as the sin nature. That is, even though we are God's redeemed new creatures in Christ, we still have a nature that is prone to wander, as the hymn says. And this is why we heard James tell us earlier that each person is tempted when he is enticed by his own desire. Our sinful hearts tempt us to sin. The final headwater of temptation is the devil, and that would also include demons under him. Perhaps you may be thinking of C.S. Lewis's famous The Screwtape Letters, where we see the demons at work trying to tempt a young believer. Well, in the scripture reading this morning, we saw Satan hard at work tempting Christ to sin. He was also at work in the opening chapters of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, tempting our great mother Eve and Adam. See, the devil is always at work trying to trip up God's people, which is why Peter calls him a roaring lion who's seeking someone to devour. Satan is hard at work trying to stoke the fires of our own flesh and to bring in the pressure of the world. And these three headwaters come together to try to take us down. This is spiritual warfare. So is it any wonder with those three headwaters feeding into our lives that Jesus tells us to pray daily, that temptation would be far from us, that the Father would protect us from these things? Of course it makes sense. Jesus wants us to have his strength and to live victoriously as his people. So he wants us to pray, lead us not into temptation. But then he takes us further in our prayers. He tells us not only to come to the Father for protection from temptation to sin, but also for protection from evil. You see, sin is evil, right? But it's not the only kind of evil that there is. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But what does that mean? Well, as soon as we dig into this half of verse 13, we run into another problem. You see, if our English translations were being super literal, what they would say is, deliver us from the evil. Deliver us from the evil. So you say to your kid, hey, watch out, there's evil out there. And they say, well, which evil? Well, the evil. All the evil. What, what is all the evil? <laughs> you see, the article the is there in Matthew's Greek record of the Lord's Prayer, which means that Jesus has some specific evil in mind. Question is, what is it? Many of our English translations, like our English Standard Version or the New American Standard or the King James, say deliver us from evil. Others, like the New King James, the New Revised Standard, the New International Version, New Living Translation and others say, deliver us from the evil one. Well, which one should it be? Is Jesus telling us to pray for deliverance from all evil or deliverance from the devil? And I'd suggest to you that the answer is, yeah, Jesus is telling us to pray for deliverance from all evil because he's specifically referring to the devil who is the source of evil in the world. So the New King James and the New International Version probably get it right when they record it as deliver us from the evil one. This is the specific evil that Jesus has in mind. Here in Matthew 6.13, the word translated evil has a... It, I know this is the last time I'm going to use grammar, okay? <laughs> 
The word evil has a Greek masculine ending, which is a form of the word evil that has a specific evil in mind, a personal evil. So R.C. Sproul in his book on the Lord's Prayer tells us that every time the New Testament writers use this ending for the word evil, they're always referring to Satan. Okay, so Jesus is teaching us in the sixth petition to pray that the Father would protect us from temptation and specifically from the evil one who tempts us. That's what's going on here in the Lord Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, just like we had to ask the question about God's relationship to our temptations, we also need to ask, what is God's relationship to the devil? Because this helps us understand what's going on here. In fact, we see just two chapters earlier in Matthew, the devil interacting with God in the form of his temptation of Jesus. Jesus is led, we're told, into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. This is literally God leading the Son of God to face temptation. But the temptation doesn't come from God, it comes from Satan. And in this case, it's God himself, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, God who is man, and that's important. It's not the Father and the Spirit being tempted, it's the Son of God who is man as, his, as a human who is being tempted. And Jesus faces this temptation as God who is fully man, and he withstands that temptation to the full, which is why earlier Josh was able to read from Hebrews to tell us Jesus knows. Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus has been there. In fact, how many times have you fallen in your temptation? Jesus never did. We capitulate. We cave. And therefore, we don't know to the full extent what temptation feels like oftentimes. Jesus knew the fullness of temptation every time, which is why Josh said he knows it in a way we couldn't possibly comprehend. And when you have that Jesus interceding for you, do you think that's a good thing? That's a pretty good thing. You see, unlike us, Jesus has no indwelling sin nature, and yet he bears the full force of temptation as the one who did that in our stead. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he not only took the full weight of our sins, he gave us the full measure of his righteousness. Righteousness under God's law, righteousness that never gave in to temptation. So when you see Jesus being tempted, he's being tempted for you. He's being tempted for me so that we would have his righteousness and so that we would be able to stand against the schemes of the devil in the one who withstood for us. The devil is the tempter of God's people even as he was the tempter of God's son, but he's vanquished by the victorious Christ and has no power to prevail over you who are in Jesus. He has no power to prevail in you because Jesus prevailed over him. The seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent, and we are united to that seed. As we see in the book of Job, Satan can do nothing except by God's express permission, because God is sovereign over even evil and sin, including the evil one. See, the devil harasses those who are in Christ, which is why Jesus teaches us here to regularly pray, deliver us from the evil one. We need to be thinking about the fact that we don't just live in a world that we can see and feel and touch. We inhabit a spiritual world as well, a world where unseen forces of evil are arrayed against us in ways that would probably terrify us if we saw them, and yet we don't need to be afraid because we come to a God who says, I will give you strength. I will make you stand. Yes, the devil is the prowling lion seeking to devour you, the great enemy seeking to destroy the works of God. And yet, we come to the Son of God, who right before he went to the cross to defeat the evil one, said this, Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. How many of Jesus' prayers do you think are answered? That includes that one. The Father would keep us from the evil one. It's important that even as we pray for the Father's protection from the devil and his demons, we also understand some key ways that God reveals that Satan is at work against us. You see, all of Scripture is God's revelation for a reason, that we would be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. And so there's a reason why 
God reveals to us some specific ways that Satan is at work against us because he wants us to be informed. And so I want to take a quick glance at four big ways that Satan harasses us. The first and most basic of which is that he distorts the truth. He distorts the truth. And we saw this at the beginning of Scripture as the devil twists God's words to Eve and ensnares her. We saw him use this ancient tactic once again in the wilderness as he was seeking to bring Jesus down. And that's no surprise. Satan is the father of lies who never ceases to distort the truth. And he takes, often he takes captive after captive after captive of those who proclaim to follow Jesus but have no clue what his word actually says. And this is why Paul warns first, uh, Paul warns Timothy. He says, now the spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Some will depart from the faith. Why? Because they follow demonic teachings, demonic distortions of the truth. Satan distorts the truth and tries to entrap us. The evil one also tries to devour us with the assaults of temptation, which is kind of the point of this whole petition, right? That, that, that Satan is doing this. And remember, God uses trials, but we're praying to be kept from temptation. Trials aim to build us up. Temptations aim to tear us down and entangle us. Jesus, when he foretold Peter's denial, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has asked to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And because Jesus prayed for Peter, even though he fell in his temptation, his faith did not fail and he was restored. Satan seeks to destroy us with temptation like he tried to destroy Peter by tempting him to deny Christ. Maybe this is what Peter had in mind when he writes to us that Satan is the one that is a roaring lion. It's on purpose that Peter's the one who wrote that. Because Peter knew full well what that meant. And this is where Satan teams up with your flesh nature to try to take you down by devouring you with temptation. He'll also try to distract you. You see, a distracted Christian is often as ineffective as a Christian who's tripped up by sin. Lots of times we go chasing off like that dog and up, squirrel, and, whoo, and off we go. And you're just like, I thought we were having a fruitful spiritual conversation with our neighbor. Yeah, but there was an... There's an ice cream truck, and it's like 100 degrees outside. You know, I mean, that's a silly example, but you get the point. That he's totally ineffective. And Satan's been distracting believers ever since the church began. I mean, look at this. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells him, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Remind them of these things. Charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Avoid irreverent babble. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. You see, the Ephesians, where Timothy was pastoring, they were tempted to get caught up in things that weren't important. They were tempted to get caught up in things that were actually tripping them up. Satan wants us to be weighted down with things that just aren't worthy of our attention. Distractions from the truth and from God's priorities abound. And Satan will take advantage of those to try to tempt you to lose sight of the truth and make you ineffective. And finally, Satan's assaults are often meant to depress and discourage you. See, Paul was one of the most effective Christians, and Satan harassed him relentlessly. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, as he was recounting a particularly difficult struggle that he was having, he says, A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And if you read through 2 Corinthians, you get the distinct impression, because Paul comes out and says it, that he was going through some really hard things. And these hard things were so severe that Paul, uh, he says, I despaired even of life itself. I despaired even of life itself. And that's the part where the counselor does a suicidal ideation test. And Paul says, but God strengthened us. Okay, God strengthened us. He delivered us and he will deliver us. Well, he goes through and records a number of his sufferings, and then he talks about this thorn, whatever it was, and says that it was a messenger of Satan. God was sovereign over the demonic opposition, and he meant it to produce godliness in Paul. He meant it to produce humility, and yet Satan meant it to produce despair and make Paul ineffective. 
And we see him doing something similar in his harassment of Job. Job went through some serious depression. The psalmists experienced serious depression and despair as they face the evil one and those who are working on his behalf. Now, listen, I'm not saying, and this is super important, I'm not saying that all depression is demonic assault. I'm not saying that, okay? But I am saying that one of Satan's aims is opposing us and tearing us down so that our joy in Christ is diminished and we're rendered ineffective because of despair. Okay, these are Satan's tactics. This is what he's up to. He distorts the truth. He devours with temptation. He tries to distract us, to depress us, to discourage us as much as he can. But we pray because Jesus teaches us to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we would do well to realize that there's two different ways that we can pray that. Okay? You can pray it and then be a sitting duck waiting to be sniped. Okay? And this is, this is the attitude of the Christian who says, God will do it all. Jesus, the work is finished. I don't need to do anything. And the answer is, yeah, the work is finished. Your redemption's done. Now get to work. Not for your redemption, but because of it. You can be a sitting duck. I mean, that's an option. It's not going to threaten your salvation, but it's not very wise. Or the second way that you can pray this is to pray the way that Jesus told his disciples in Gethsemane when he said, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'd suggest you take the second option. Take the second option. Watch and pray. Wage war on sin. As John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Jesus says that he's building his church and that the gates of hell won't prevail. Guess what? Gates are defense mechanisms. When's the last time you ever attacked somebody by taking the front gate from your house and then chasing them down the street? That's an absurd image. <laughs> we don't go chasing people with gates. We put gates there so that people won't come in and start chasing us. Well, if Jesus says the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, what position does that put the church in? We're on offense, folks. Yeah, this is the dominion of darkness, but guess what? We belong to the light. We belong the one to the one who came into this world of darkness as the victor. He's the one who crushed the head of the serpent. And so we are on the offense. We are storming hell by God's grace and in his strength. And I'd suggest that it's far more strategic to know how to do that well than to just run haphazard into the fray and hope that it all goes well. And so I want to finish this morning by looking at four critical means that God intends to use to deliver you from the evil one and guard you from temptation. Four critical means that God wants to use to answer this prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's four vital ways to wage a good war against sin and Satan. The first is stay out of harm's way. Stay out of harm's way. And you might say, but yet, wait, I thought you said we're running into battle. Isn't that harm's way? Yeah, that's not what I mean. When we pray, deliver, you know, um, lead us not into temptation, it is probably a good idea for us not to lead, oursel lead ourselves into temptation. You know what I'm saying, right? How often have you prayed, Oh, Lord, help me not to do this thing that I'm about to walk into doing. Oh, no, it happened. What happened? Don't even get me started. We, we do this. I mean, oh, we do this. So someone struggles with overeating, and as they sit down to the buffet that they went to, they pray, Lord, deliver me from, from evil. Okay, genius. <laughs> Or a man or a woman who's trapped in the pit of pornography sits down to the computer by themselves with no one else at home yet again and prays, Lord, give me strength. And then they fall. Hmm. Okay. Try that again. Or a young parent struggling with anger who every single time they go through a sleepless night wakes up more tempted to anger, losing control of their temper more. And then they just stay up, wasting the hours into the early morning. Not because they, they can't sleep, but because they're just choosing a little me time. Knowing all the while that they're going to pray, deliver me from my anger. 
Well, friends, we have no business praying to be kept from temptation when we're the ones leading ourselves into temptation. The Father will never lead you into temptation, but you may lead yourself. So go to bed. Get the sleep that you need. Stay away from situations that ensure you'll be exposed to sexual temptation. Don't walk down the alcohol aisles in the store if you have trouble with self-control in your drinking. As I tell my kids sometimes, use your brain. <laughs> when you see me being an idiot, tell me, Rick, use your brain. God gave it to you as a gift, a gift to use as he is answering your prayer. Lead me not into temptation. So stay out of harm's way as you trust your protecting father. Second, pick up your sword. Pick up your sword, which, as Paul told us in Ephesians 6, is the word of God. If you know that Satan's prime tactic is to distort the truth, then you need to be intimately acquainted with the truth. You need to be intimately acquainted with the truth. Now, what this doesn't mean is simply knowing where the books are. It means knowing what's in the books and what God means by what's in there. It means knowing the Word of God. This is a lifelong journey of getting into your Bible daily and not only learning where the things are, but what God means in them. It's good to be in church and to hear God's Word preached weekly, but do you take up your sword daily? You see, God's given it to you for a reason, and a weapon that you don't know how to use isn't going to be very effective. You see, normally swords, like actual ones, get dull with use and they need to be sharpened. But the sword of the Spirit is the one that gets sharper in your hand the more you use it. So pick up your sword. And if you take your Christian life seriously at all, you need the weapon God's given you. That's why the psalmist prays in Psalm 119.11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, when you store up God's word in your heart, you'll not only know what the Bible says, but you'll be learning more and more how to use it. Because this, this tool, friends, this is not an imprecise tool. You're not running into the battle with a club. You're running in with a very precise tool, one that we're told is so sharp it gets down to the division between soul and spirit. Peter tells us that it contains all things necessary for life and godliness, which is why so many times when a believer says, let, let me pray about that. It doesn't make sense, not because we shouldn't be praying about things, but because so many of those things that we say, I need to pray about it and see what God wants. And he's actually already told us. We need to pick up the sword and use it. You may have seen some posters around the church saying, the King's Institute, coming fall 2022. You may not have seen them because I've gotten virtually no questions about what it is. The King's Institute, because you asked, is a new branch of our Sunday seminars ministry that's actually aimed at this very thing, to give an avenue for us as a church to go deeper and be more effective in our grasp of God's word. The King's Institute is Sunday seminars, just like it always has been, but with a deeper emphasis. And so each quarter, there's going to be a registration open for the coming seminar. It's a, it's a registration that requires a deeper commitment from those who want to participate in it. Uh, a commitment to weekly attendance, to doing a reasonable amount of outside reading and writing, to participate in group discussions, to get into the word together so that we would be more faithfully equipped to use that word in life. That's what that's all about. And it's going to be starting this fall, just so you know. So keep your eyes out. In August, we'll have registration open. It's free. But <laughs> Well, whether you're able to commit to the King's Institute or whether you decide to continue with one of our normal Sunday seminars, the elders strongly encourage you to use that ministry because that's the whole point. I promise there's nothing more useful that you can be doing for those 45 minutes on a Sunday morning than be getting into the word with the teachers that God has given to this church, which is why it just doesn't make sense to me that a number of people just arbitrarily decide to skip out and go do I don't know what. It must be really good. But friends, please, we need to stand together against the schemes of the devil. We have to know the truth because that is how he is defeated every time. That's how Jesus did it. And I'm pretty sure that we don't know our Bibles half as well as he did. So let's get into it together. And speaking of standing together, that's actually the third way that we can stand against the schemes of the devil and wage a good war. Lone soldiers never defeated an enemy army. And lone Christians fall every single time. So notice that the Lord's Prayer is a corporate prayer. I mean, we need to be praying it individually, but Jesus actually teaches it to us together. 
And so just in this sixth petition alone, it says, lead us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Friends, this is an us business. The church is an us situation, and we need to pray for one another. Be praying for those in your small group. Be praying for the friends that God has given you in this church that they would stand against the temptations that you know they're prone to, that the person next to you doesn't know that they're prone to. Ask hard questions. Get into one another's lives in a winsome and honest, forthright way. Speak plainly with one another, as it says in Leviticus 19. If you've been a part of Sun Valley Church for any length of time, but you don't know anybody on a truly spiritual level, you are in a dangerous place and you are vulnerable to satanic assault and likely to fall. We need one another. In the Ephesians passage on the armor of God that was read earlier, the apostle ends by commanding us to pray for one another and then he himself asks for prayer. If Paul needs the prayers of the saints in order to stand, I'm pretty sure we do too. So stand together. And lastly, we need to put on Christ. We need to put on Christ. This is what all of the other things get subsumed into. This is what all of the other things are for, that we would put on Christ. Temptation and sin and Satan can only be resisted by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is that? Well, it's the same thing as putting on the armor of God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 13. He says, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Well, okay, okay, Paul, how do we do that? Well, he tells us, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Putting on Christ is what it means to walk in the spirit, which is the same thing as living dependently on God in obedience to his word. It's the same thing. This is the normal Christian life. It's what it looks like to do spiritual warfare. You see, spiritual warfare isn't casting out demons. It's actually drawing near to God in prayer, delving into his word, loving his people, worshiping him corporately, being baptized, taking the Lord's Supper. All of this is spiritual warfare. It's taking every thought and worldly philosophy captive to the obedience of Christ because the enemy is all around us. And this world is filled with false ideas. It's living under the kingship of Jesus in prayerful dependence on the Father, which is, by the way, why it's called the King's Institute. Because we live under a king, and he's a mighty good one. The, the, probably the most interesting thing about the armor of God and the thing that is least realized, every single one of the pieces of the armor, it, didn't just, it wasn't Paul just sitting in a Roman cell looking at a soldier and going, hey, I see an analogy here. Maybe I can get a book deal from this, this cool concept. All right. Friends, it goes back to Isaiah. It goes back to Psalms. And point for point, you can go through the armor of God, go back to your Old Testament and find that it's the servant of the Lord. It's Jesus who puts on the armor of God. So when you put on Christ, you're putting on the full armor of God. That is how you stand against temptation and the devil. So there it is. We've we finished the six petitions of the Lord Prayer. And next week, we're going to conclude with the doxology in the footnotes. And I'll tell you why it's in a footnote and why I'm doing a whole sermon about it. But when it comes to this sixth and final petition, remember the big idea and take it seriously. Seek the Father's protecting care daily as you flee from temptation and war against sin. He will strengthen you. We can stand together because we do not stand alone. We stand in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are a good and loving Father, that your will for us, your desire, and your intention is that we would stand strong against the temptations that arise within our own hearts from the assaults of an evil one who wants to use the full allurement of the world to drag us away from you. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are the victorious Son of God who stood under temptation in our stead and resisted to the uttermost. 
that we might have your righteousness. We praise you, Holy Spirit, that you do not leave us, that you are the seal of our redemption until we acquire possession of it. So day by day, may we lean heavily into you and the full resource of your power at work in us to do that which is pleasing to God. Train our hearts and tune us to delight in these things, to find deeper and deeper joy and satisfaction in our Savior, to see sin as disgusting, to put off the temptations that so easily entrap us, and to walk in your will and delight in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.